Hallelujah. I always love hearing these testimonies, especially Brother Dave's here this evening. You know, uh, we were singing that song that he's real in my soul. He's real. He's real. He's not fake. He's real. And, uh, you know, when I was, uh, I think I was about 17 years old, I attended a Mormon service. Now, where I grew up, there was either you were either Mormon or you were Catholic. And so I attended a Mormon service uh, for one of my friends. He was leaving on his mission. And, you know, I was young and I don't know why I attended. I can't remember. I just probably wanted to go support him. But I went and everybody there was emotionless. They had absolutely no emotion. They had absolutely no thankfulness, no gratefulness on their face. They weren't excited about their God. You know, and I've been to Catholic services where they kneel down every 30 seconds and they say, pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, and they, they splash holy water, whatever the case. They're not excited about their God. And I'm sure that it's about with every other religion because when you don't got the Spirit of God, you've got nothing. And we, I see you guys getting excited for your God. The one God, the true God. Hallelujah. In His presence is fullness of joy. You know, when me and my grandmother, when she was here, you know, we, we got together and we just played worship music and we talked about the Lord for hours and it just seemed like moments. And, you know, I remember those times where I'd be sitting with my grandmother in the living room and she'd be witnessing to me. And we would have a time in the Lord and now I enjoy it so much. And I want to encourage you tonight and I felt like the Lord would have me to say this. You know, my grandmother, she prayed for all of her family members. Now, I believe with all my heart, my grandmother's called to teach. She's a wonderful teacher of the word, probably better in Spanish than she is in English. But that's where she's at right now. She's teaching the word of God. But she taught me the word of God and she prayed for me, constantly prayed for me and my family. And I, I want to say that I'm the fruit of her prayer. I'm the fruit of her prayer. I can't take credit for anything. I, I can't say that I didn't get, I, I got out because my grandmother had enough faith to believe God for the impossible concerning her son or her grandson, Kobe. Hallelujah. And the same faith that she had, the same prayers is not above your prayers. It's the same. God hears them all the same. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. You know, when I went to uh, guacamole, I, I mean, Guatemala. <laughs> Guatemala. When I went to Guatemala, you know, there were some very faithful people there. Very, very faithful people there that um, when I walked into the service, when I walked in my very first church service over there, I sat in the corner and I cried for about 15 minutes. The presence of God was so strong over me. And I felt a tremendous love for, of God on my heart for my family. And at that time, my dad and I were not seeing eye to eye because he didn't he didn't agree with me going to Guatemala. He thought it was too dangerous. But as I sat there in that service, I had such a love for my dad. I mean, not just a Kobe love. I mean, a God kind of love. And ever since I've been praying for my dad and my dad's slowly but surely coming around. Amen. He's slowly but surely coming around. Hallelujah. And I'm believing it and proclaiming that one day at these altars, my dad is going to come down and kneel before the king of kings and Lord of lords. Glory to God. Amen. Good old guacamole showed me that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, open up to me. Oh, open up. Open up to the word of God. That's what I get for making fun of him. <laughs> John chapter 4, would you? John chapter 4 <laughs> and verse 46. Hallelujah. You know, I got this new tablet, and I, I vowed that I would never get a tablet as my Bible. You know, I wanted, you know, bless God. I'm going to have paper all the time. You know, I'm going to have the word of God, bless God. You know, but it just does so much stuff. It's so convenient, so I had to get it. But uh, I, I brought my, my other Bible just in case because I've been around the pastor long enough to know that technology does not work well around him. <laughs> and anything with a battery, I can't trust. Amen. Are you there? Amen. John chapter 4, verse 46. The word of the Lord says this. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee where he had made the water and wine, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. 
When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went up into him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the noble man said unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus said unto him, Go your way, your son lives. And the man believed the word of God that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was going down, the servants met him and told him, saying, Your son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour that he began to amend, and they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour which Jesus said unto him, Your son lives, and himself believed in his whole house. Let me read that last verse again, okay? So the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Your son lives... And himself believed and his whole house. Let me just say this, and I felt led of the Lord. You're one word away. You're one word away. You're one word away from your needs being met. Hallelujah. You know, as we were singing and as we were worshiping the Lord this morning, I didn't have a message for tonight, you know, and as a minister, I, I always like to be prepared, but the Lord didn't have it on my heart because he wanted to show me something this morning in our service. Because when we come together and we come and the Spirit of God begins to move, I believe the Lord wants to show us something. And he showed me something as I began to worship him. He said, you're one word away from your needs being met. All you need is Jesus to say the word and you believe it and it will happen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something. The word of Almighty God is yea and amen. It doesn't pass away. The heavens and the earth will pass away, but not one dot or tittle shall pass away from the word of Almighty God. The promises that he made in his word are for you and for me. They're not for somebody over there or somebody over here. It's for this church right now, right here. Glory to God. Glory to God. You don't have to wait for your promise tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Father, I ask you, Lord God, that you would anoint my lips. You would anoint, Lord, the ears, Lord, and give us encouragement tonight to believe. Lord, build faith in us. Your word says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that faith would build in us, Lord, to believe the impossible, Lord, to believe you for great and mighty things. I believe that the days of miracles are not over, Lord. The days of great harvest are not over. The days of great outpouring of your spirit are not over, Lord. Teach us what we need to know, Lord. Lead us and guide us into all truth. And we ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. And the church said, amen Amen and amen. You're one word away. You're one word away. You know, the Gospels are the most important of most important books in the entirety of the word because it depicts the life of Jesus Christ, our Savior. It depicts who he is and what he did for us at Calvary's cross and his resurrection. If we didn't have the Gospels, we we wouldn't know who the Father really is in fullness because Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead. We know God the Father because we have seen Jesus. And when we read about Jesus in the Gospels, we read about who God really is. And so every book, every gospel has a different theme. It has a different uh, aspect that it reaches out to. But the gospel of John is a little bit different than every other book in the entirety of the word of God. You know, they say, and I like to say this because I went to Baba College. But they say that 92% of all of the gospel of John is unique to itself. You see, the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're called the synoptic Gospels. That means they're very similar in, in, in their content. They tell some of the same stories. And, and so they're very similar, but John is a little bit different. He says a lot of things are very unique, and only John wrote about them. You hear about uh, a lot of the, you know, Nicodemus. You don't hear about that in the other ones. You hear about this story. You don't hear about it in the other Gospels, and there's a reason for it. In Matthew, we see that Jesus is described or is portrayed as the king, as the Messiah. 
And a lot of the uh, uh, emphasis of that book is the words and the teachings of Christ. And you see in Mark, you see that he is portrayed as the servant of God. There was a lot of miracles in that book. A lot of things where he healed mighty, and a lot of mighty things were done. He was the servant of God. And in Luke, he is described as the son of man, the, the 100% God, yet 100% man, the, the hypostatic union, if you want to get theological. But in the book of John, he is portrayed as the son of God. The Son of God. Now, I know that we are all sons and daughters of God, amen? But there is a different title to Jesus being the Son of God. It's different than what our title is being sons and gods. He is the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father. It depicts that He wasn't just the Son of God when He was born. He was the Son of God from eternity's past. That he had a particular relationship with the Father and the Spirit in eternity's past, so close and so, so intimate that he is the Son of God. He is deity. He's not just part of God. He's not just a second God. He is God. Hallelujah. You see that in the first chapter. The Word of Almighty God was in the beginning. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He's not just another human being. That's what a lot of people say. You know, I was listening to uh, uh, what, Israel's, what Israel's take on Jesus is today. You know, they, there was a Christian that went around Israel today, and I love Israel, and I'm, I'm going to be Israel's friend, and I'm going to support Israel, but they have not yet accepted the Messiah. They will, though. In that coming day, they will. We can't give up on Israel. A a anyway, <laughs> but he went around and he asked, well, who do you think Jesus is? And they said, well, he, he was a great prophet. That's what we believe. He was a great prophet. And almost all of the, the Jewish people said that. But, you know, as Christians, we believe that he was the son of God. He was God in the flesh. He dwelt among us. He was the light of man. Hallelujah. He was the light that entered into this world. Amen. No, he wasn't just another man. He, he operated as a man while he was on earth. Now, understand that. He didn't use his deity while he was on earth. He, he was completely reliant upon the Holy Spirit walking on this earth. But you see, Jesus... Hold on, let me find my notes because I'm getting off topic here. <laughs> but Jesus, in, in the third chapter of John and the fourth chapter, he deals with three different people, okay? Okay. He deals with Nicodemus, he deals with the woman of Samaria, and he deals with this man, the nobleman that was losing his son. Now this is important because Nicodemus came to him and he was a religious leader. He, he was the, one of the, the leaders of the synagogue coming to Jesus by night and he believed that he was sent from God. Now he believed, and I believe it personally, that he believed he was the Messiah. But he came to Jesus and he asked him, what must I do to be saved? He should have known, right? He should have known what I should have done to be saved. And Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be born again. And he started describing him what it means to be born again. But he used the natural terms in order to talk about the things of the spirit. And Nicodemus just didn't get it. He didn't understand what, was, what, what he was saying. He, he just couldn't understand it because his religion got in the way. His flesh got in the way. His carnality got in the way. And sometimes we're a little bit too religious for Jesus to get in our way. Sometimes we need to back off the old Kobe religious and get on just a little bit of Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes we have to learn how to admit that we're wrong about something. Yep. Oh, come on. I'm preaching better now. I'm preaching now. Sometimes we got to admit to ourselves we don't know everything. We, we're not right about everything of the Bible. We're, we're not going to be perfect while here on earth. There's no graduating class of the Word of God. We are continuously learning. Paul would say, I have not apprehended nor arrived, but I press towards the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. We haven't arrived in the fullness of the knowledge. We, we see through a glass dimly right now. Okay, he describes us as sheep towards the slaughter. I mean, I don't know about you, but sheep are dumb. And sometimes we get a little bit religious. Sometimes we say, no, Lord, I don't need your help right now. I can do this myself, bless God. 
And so a lot of religions, they, they say, if you do this, that, or the other, then you'll receive this. Now listen, there's no formula in the Word of God. There's not, I do this, this, and this, and then God will move. It's according to His will and His grace. So you can pray, and you can do fast, and you can do 21 days of this, and, and all of that and the other, and it'll bless you. But if it's not in God's will, if you're not doing it according to His grace, then it's not going to do you any good. Hallelujah. Don't let religion get in the way of your relationship. I, a couple, I want to say it was about six or seven months ago, and I was teaching on the book of Romans. And I came home one night, and I was living by myself at the time. Now I live with my mom. But I came home one night, and you go through routines. You know, you get in a, a routine, and there's nothing wrong with a routine. You get a routine, I was getting ready for bed, and I was brushing my teeth, getting ready, and I, I like to worship the Lord a little bit, put on some music, and, and I was just saying, praise the Lord, bless God, hallelujah. You know, just, you know, the religious stuff. Oh, glory to God, I was so holy in that moment, glory to God. I, I went through the day, I didn't sin, I, I, I mean, I was doing good, and I went to bed, I said, glory to God. And then I went, and, and, and I sat down, and, and I believe the Lord spoke to me, he said, are you do you really mean what you say? Are you just saying it because you think I want to hear it? <laughs> Hello? Hello? You know, and then after that, I started praying. I said, Lord, I don't want another empty praise. I don't want another empty prayer. I don't want another empty church service. I don't want to come just because I got to come. I want to come so I can be touched by you. I can be filled with your spirit. I can know your word better. I can be built up in faith. Hallelujah. Don't let religion get in the way. Hallelujah. And you know, when he goes and he talks with the woman of Samaria, the woman at the well, and he's leaving, he's going back to, to Galilee and Cana, and he, and he was going there, but he, he said, I must needs go. <laughs> I must needs go. Because <laughs> he knew who he was going to come across. The woman at the well. And he goes to the well, and there's a woman there, and he says, Give me, give me some water. Okay. He said, I have water for you that if you drink it, you shall never thirst again. You shall never thirst again. I have water that you know not of. You shall never thirst again. The water of salvation. Hallelujah. The water of life. She said, Lord, give me that water. But, you know, he had to deal with her and her sin first. You know, before we start preaching about the blessings of God and, and you can have this and that or the other, we've got to deal with the main problem in people's life. And I'm sorry to say it's not financial problems. That's not the main problem. It's a problem. It's not the, uh, 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 the domestic problem. That's maybe a problem, but it's not the main problem. The main problem in the lives of people is sin. I'm sorry to say Sin is the reason why people are going to go to hell. Sin's the reason why Jesus had to die. Sin is a major problem, and we can't just brush over it with a, with a paintbrush and call it good. It has to be washed with blood. Glory to God. So he had to deal with her sin that she went out into the world thinking that five husbands would do her good, and she went and she found out that that didn't satisfy her. It didn't satisfy her. The world will never satisfy. Sin will never satisfy anybody. You know, sin is fun for a season, but it gets real old real quick. Glory to God. You know, when I was 17, and I've told you this testimony time and time again, but I'll say it one more time because I can. It's my, I'm, it's my time. But I started living for the Lord, and as a young, as a young man, the first thing that the devil's going to uh, come at me with is not going to be religion, because I don't know enough in order to be religious. I, he's not going to come at me with all sorts of different... He's going to come at me with the pull of the world. The world is, is very strong, and as a young man, I was very susceptible to the pull of the world. That's not new to a lot of new Christians. You know, I know a couple of Christians who were in drugs, and, and their family friends are in drugs, and... and, and all kinds of alcohol, all kinds of partying, all kinds of horrible things. And they got miraculously saved. And God delivered them from them all. But yet now they're back in the world. They're back to doing what they were doing. Because there's a pull to the world. 
It's not something, you know, and I don't think any of you have that problem here. But, you know, there is that problem in the modern church today, especially with young folk, especially with young Christians, immature Christians. The world pulls in. The world was pulling at the Samaritan woman. He had to deal with it. But then we come to the nobleman's son. This man was a nobleman. He, he was probably, and I heard it said, that he was an officer of Herod there in Galilee. And he had a lot of money. He was a rich man. But his son was to the point of death. And sometimes the world or, or things will happen where, where we're in a situation, a temptation, where it's something other than having to do with us. A family member is sick or something's going on on the outside and we can't do nothing about it. And we see this nobleman, he was rich. He, he couldn't afford the, uh, uh, he couldn't pay for healing. He couldn't pay for salvation. He couldn't pay for deliverance. But he heard that Jesus was coming to Galilee. He heard he was coming back to Cana where he did his first miracle. He heard and he got desperate. He got desperate. You know, the church needs to start getting desperate for Jesus again. It needs to start getting desperate for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It needs to start getting desperate for a move of God. We can't be complacent anymore. There's no time to be complacent. And I'm preaching to myself. There's no time to be lazy. There's no time to sit around. We've got to go out and to the highways and to the byways and to compel them to come into the kingdom. We've got to seek God's face in these last days. Hallelujah. And he sought after Jesus and he went to Jesus that he heard that did many miracles in the Passover week. He went and he said, I could just get to Jesus and he could come and touch my son and he'll be healed. Now, you got to understand he was from Capernaum. That's about a 20 mile journey from Capernaum to Cana. And he went to Jesus and he said, Jesus, I beg of you, would you come and heal my son? Because if you don't, he's going to die. Come or else he's going to die. You could feel the desperation, but yet Jesus mildly rebukes him. He says, unless you see signs or wonders, you won't believe. But then Jesus said, go, your son lives. But the word of the Lord says this, that he believed the word of God or word of Jesus. He got up and he went home. He didn't press more for Jesus. He didn't say, no, Lord, you don't understand. You have to come this 20 miles. He believed the word from Almighty God, Jesus in the flesh. He believed it, and he went home to a son that was healed. Not a son that was maimed and fevered. He went home with a son that was healed. Glory to God. And when they saw this mighty miracle of God, he said, what time did he lose that fever? He said it was about 7 o'clock. Hallelujah. He said, you know what? That was when I spoke with Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's when I spoke with Jesus. Glory to God. And his whole house believed. You know, there's a reason for the season. I, I don't like that. I don't know why I said that. But there's a reason for a season. There's a reason why we go through what we go through. There's a reason why people go through what they're going through. And the majority of the time, I would have to say, it's to bless others. You know, Smith Wigglesworth, one of the great evangelists of, 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 of the uh, New England, all that area over there in Ireland and Scotland and stuff. He did mighty, massive miracles, healings. People would get healed. One time he got a baby who had spina bifida. And he told the parents, do you trust me? He heard from the Lord, and the Lord said, this is what you got to do, and that baby will be healed. And he told the parents, do you trust me? They said, yeah. He threw that baby, and the baby hit the wall, and the baby fell, and then he went over to the baby, and he kicked the baby. And that baby giggled. <laughs> the baby giggled. <laughs> and he did mighty, mighty miracles. But then he got a letter from the Americas, and and people were inviting him to come out. They said, I want, I want to hear you 
preach over here and have revivals over here. We want you to come. And Smith Wigglesworth said this, and I, I read it somewhere, I heard it somewhere. He said, poor Smith, they would prefer to have you than Jesus. They would prefer to have you, and not long after that, he passed and went on to be with the Lord. You know, sometimes people, they, oh, they want us signs and miracles, but before we have the signs and miracles, we have to have faith in the Word of God. We have to have faith that what Jesus said is going to come to pass. We have to have the word from God. And, you know, I don't have time to get into it, but I wanted to. You know, my favorite scripture, I think, in the entirety of the word of God is 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 18, where he says, For the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish, but unto us that believe it is the power of God. You know, and, you know, when you go to Bible college... You learn that in the Greek, in the original way, the word preaching actually means word. It doesn't mean the physical act of preaching. It means a certain message, a certain word that must be preached. And that word that comes out, the word of the cross, is the power unto us that, say, that are saved. Let me, under, let me get, get you to try to understand something. When Jesus went to the cross, he finished the work for our salvation. And so when we accepted that, we were completely and wonderfully saved. We were changed and bought and born again. But it didn't stop there. Glory to God. He miraculously saved us from the power of sin. He changed all that was within us. And we don't have to live under sin anymore. We don't have to struggle in this life anymore. We can have victory because of what Jesus did for us. Hallelujah. Do you believe the word of God? Do you believe the word of the cross? Do you believe it is finished? You know, sister, she said something. I don't remember all of it, but he says here, just rest in the assurance of the finished work of the cross. Let me tell you something that hit me. Because when it comes to things that I need, it's only because of the cross, only because of Jesus and what he did that I can have the things that I need. I can only enter into the throne room of grace by the blood of the lamb. And because of what he did for me, I can worship in spirit and in truth. Because of what he did for me, I can live a righteous and holy life. Because of what he did for me, my family can get saved. Because of what he did for me, I can live victorious over the devil. Because of what he did for me, my healing is in in full account. Because of what he did for me, I can have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and continual baptism in the Holy Spirit, bless God. Because of what he did for me, I can walk in his statutes and his commandments. Because of what he did for me, the church doesn't have to be dry and dead, but the church can be alive and free. Woo! Do you believe the word? All you are are one word away from receiving what you've been believing for. Hallelujah. Jesus just has to say it and it's going to come to pass. Glory to God. And I'll just close with this. Man, it's hot up here. (laughs) Glory to God. Glory to God. (laughs) You know, I heard somebody say this one time, that whenever a preacher comes and he preaches behind a pulpit, he just doesn't show up blindly. Just, he's got to be led by the Lord to preach the gospel. And I always ask the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm a little young, but I know you can use me. And you know, in these couple of years that I've been preaching the gospel, I've been more than blessed. There's nothing greater than to preach the word that will set men free. That will set men free. It's the word of Almighty God that will set men free. It's not psychology. It's not humanism. It's not Buddhism. It's the word that Jesus Christ came and shed his blood. We're free tonight. I don't know if you feel it tonight, but I do. Hallelujah. I feel free. I feel free. I feel free. But we have to have faith as the nobleman had faith. 
We have to believe as the noblemen believe. There are problems and there always will be problems. You know, there will be temptation. There will always be temptation. The devil will fight you tooth and nail. He will fight you. And you know this already. I'm just preaching the choir. But you know, the apostle Paul said that he fought the good fight of faith. He fought the good fight of faith. That's what we're called to. You know, when I was eight years old, and I want to tell this short story, and then I'll, I'll, then I'll close. I got an experience with the Lord where the Spirit of God moved upon my heart, and I was eight. My grandma says I was nine. She has to repent because she's a liar. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But we went to this church service, and me and my cousins were there, and the Spirit of God moved all over me, and after that, the Lord has been with me ever since. And one night, <laughs> my cousins came over to my dad's house, my dad and my stepmom's house, and we were there, and us cousins were really close at that time. And we were talking about the Lord, little eight, nine, ten-year-olds just talking about the Lord. And, and we were pretending like we were fighting the devil. I remember that. We were pretending like we're fighting the devil. Now, serious. We were being serious. And we were laughing at it. You know, we were, we were laughing, but we were fighting. We, we were excited about the Lord. But you know, as I got older, the Lord started telling me, you ain't got to fight no more. The battle is won. <laughs> Hallelujah. You don't have to fight no more. The battle is won. The cross of Christ is my assured hope. It is what I go to in the morning and say, Lord, because of the cross, I can enter into your presence. Because of the blood of Jesus, I can receive that which I want. I don't have to fight anymore. I'm just believing your word, Lord. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me tonight? If you're believing God for something tonight, I want to invite you to pray. We'll pray with you. If not, we'll, we'll go ahead and pray and dismiss. But if you have something that the Lord has laid on your heart to believe for, you can come. Right now, as we begin to worship the Lord and Christians praying and praising God, would you praise God just for but a moment? And just start thanking Him for His mercy and His grace and the Word that He's given us. And believe it, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we come before you in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We ask you, Lord God, that your people would go forth and believe. Lord, build faith in their hearts, Lord, to believe, Lord, for the impossible, for the healings that need to take place, for the salvation of the loved ones, Lord God. Lord, bring them through the valley of the shadow of death with faith, Lord, that you will bring them through a great shepherd you are, Jesus. We ask you, Lord God, to bless your people with a double portion of your Holy Spirit. Bless them, Lord God, with a mighty abundance of your provision, Lord, from heaven that Jesus afforded, Lord. Hallelujah. You are worthy, Lord, of our praise. You're worthy of all exaltation, Lord. We just thank you in the house tonight. We need a revival of your spirit, Lord. If we don't have a revival, Lord God, in the churches of today, my generation will die off, Lord. And Lord, we come before you pleading for a harvest of soul, a latter-day rain, that your church would grow, Lord. Your church would revive back to holiness, revive back to a power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. We ask you, Lord, that the word would be proclaimed in these churches, Lord. And in our mouths, Lord, as we go, that the generation of mine would come to know the power that this generation in the house knows already. Hallelujah. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy. Oh, Rama Shandala Maromo Shiria Kandala Maromo We believe your word tonight that you would save our families, Lord. We believe it, Lord, with all of our hearts. Help any unbelief in us, Lord. We pray, Father, you're worthy, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.